Proving Grounds. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, Versprite, Protivity, Tenable, Woo! Amazon, and Source of Knowledge. I'm not clapping for Tenable. <laughs> I will. Ouch. That's so, why I'm sitting in the middle. So as Guy, Guy, Dude fella, Guy McDude fella, Guy McDude fella has said, um, we're going to be recording this talk, and uh, I'm going to be running the mic. So just please wait for the mic before you ask your question. So, have you ever wondered why call for paper reviewers drink so much? Are you tired of having talks rejected from conferences without knowing why? Would you like to know what really makes reviewers happy or irritated? Well, stick around for our next panel on Call for Papers 101. So please join me in welcoming the panelists. Yeah. We're going to start out with introductions, right? Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm David. I'm your erstwhile moderator today. Uh, otherwise known as David of the Clan CFP. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi. I'm Megan Totenkoff. Uh, I'm a senior security analyst with, uh, or consultant with Rapid7. Uh, my name is Moe. I avoid work on a regular basis, so I'm in management. I'm Guy McDudefella. I am a compliance audit research engineer for Tenable Network Security. <laughs> which is way better than Rapid9. <laughs> oh. Um, so, really quickly, David, before we get started, in, in all honesty, and, and I was giving Eric a little bit of a hard time earlier, I think there's going to be two types of people in the room right now. Either one, people who are part of CFP review boards. <laughs> This is why we don't take you places. <laughs> You're not my real dad. Um, either people who are part of CFP review boards and want to make some, uh, make a comment or something, and we, we want this to be conversational. This is B-sides afterward, uh, overall. And then um, also people who have active questions. So um, if you do have a question at any time, feel free to interrupt us. Raise your hand. Eric will run over there with the mic and uh, I'll give it to you, and we could, we could talk about it. Sorry about that. No, 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 no. So, I mean, to actually, I want to touch on that a little more. So, I mean, ostensibly, this was about, you know, how CFP works and how to get your talk accepted. But if you have questions, like Bowie said, about, you know, you're on a CFP committee and you're trying to figure out, you know, how do you decide what talks to accept or not accept or how do you figure out you know, the, the, the criteria and things like that, please, you know, feel free to ask those questions as well. We're, yeah. we're very uh, agnostic. As long as it has something to do with a CFP, uh, yeah. we're good. Why do I have two? Oh, okay. Two, two, two token costs. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm going to start with this up. Yeah. We, we were discussing this earlier, uh, and the first rule, which is actually also the second rule for CFPs, is follow the directions. And follow so, the directions. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a couple of submissions that we received this year that felt that some of our um, fields in OpenConf were optional. If we put something there, we want you to respond. We want you to give us that information. Don't just give us a couple line blurb for your abstract and think it's sufficient for your outline as well, because it's not. Uh. Right. If they ask for X, Y, and Z, give them X, Y, and Z. Don't add anything. Um, don't feel like Z is optional. Uh, if there's a you know a two thousand word limit in the field, try to use as much of that as possible. What you want to make sure you do is you're conveying your thoughts clearly. Uh, and but more importantly, you know how to follow instructions. This is your first introduction to the con overall. So you want them to know, yeah, working with me is going to be a positive experience because they're putting some trust in you. And, and if, if you're, if the con, if the, the CFP instructions are things like new talks only, don't submit the talk you gave at, at B-Sides Ontario. If, if well, it's calling for new speakers, don't submit the talk you gave at DEF CON. You're not a new speaker. There are instructions there. There are, the CFP committee is looking for certain certain types of talks for certain tracks of the conference and 
going against that isn't going to win you any favors. And also just a little bit about that. So with the Proving Grounds track in particular, we ask for new speakers only. And it's a little cloudy because we have to do the announcement via Twitter. What does that mean? So we say no national conferences, things like DevCon, um, DerbyCon, ShmooCon. B-Sides Las Vegas and B-Sides San Francisco are included in that as well. But if you've spoken at another regional conference, like uh, one of the smaller B-Sides or another um, regional conference that wasn't recorded, you're still um, applicable to apply for Proving Grounds. So one of the things that was alluded to is that <clears throat> You know, unless you are an incredibly well-known speaker, and even then, it, with, with your committee, when you submit a CFP, this is your first impression. And one of the things that I encounter a lot, I'm pretty sure that my, my panelists here will agree, is that people don't always spell check or grammar check mm -hmm. their submissions. So I'd like to hear your thoughts, because there, there was some rather strident language being used <laughs> in the speaker room. <laughs> <laughs> um, Guy, I think you had some, some good thoughts on that one. If you have, <clears throat> if you were of the opinion in high school that English class was something you were never going to use, you were fucking wrong. <laughs> use punctuation, use capital letters, follow a style guide. Go, go get a style guide. Go watch James Arlen's talks on how to, how to yeah. communicate yeah. to other people. Because the man is not wrong. A lot, of, a lot of people in InfoSec are in technical roles. And so we're not responsible for direct communication with clients or direct communication more than you know two or three sentences in a, in a ticket or two or three sentences in an email. Unfortunately, when you're writing a talk or writing a CFP response, it is the exact opposite. You need to be verbose, you need to be clear, you need to be concise, and you need to be well organized. And we get talks that look like a fucking E. Cummings poem. <laughs> so. But with less structure. With less structure. <laughs> um, and, and to build on that, you know, even if you're not going to go and get a style guide, there's tools out there that will help yes. you out. I'm not a great writer. I know that. That's a weakness of mine. Um, but I use things like Grammarly to help me out to review what I'm going to submit before I submit it to make sure that, that you know, I'm, I'm good and I'm, I'm signed off. You have to, to look at it from the reviewer's perspective as well. In, in some cases, and, and David could talk to this even a little bit more, you know, these folks are reviewing tens if not hundreds of submissions. So immediately not being able to cohesively understand the writing is going to put you at a disadvantage because it's like, I, I have to figure this out in order for you to convey your idea to me. What makes, what makes me think that you're going to be able to do this, you know, yeah. in front of 50, 100 people? The CFP yeah. board will, sorry. No, go ahead. The CFP board of reviewers will spend on average two to five minutes per talk in the first round just to figure out whether or not you are sane enough to put in front of a group of people, right? And if you're not able to convey what you want to talk about in two minutes of writing, we're just going to ignore your talk and you're not going to make it onto the second round of review. So I do have something to say about the verbosity thing. I actually am fine if you're concise. Yeah. Like if you can clearly state what you want to do in 10 words instead of 50, that is totally fine. I just need to be able to understand, okay, this is what you want to talk about and the why and how you're going to get me to um, yeah. the main purpose of your talk. But the thing is that you really can't give a CFP committee too much detail about your talk. Exactly. And uh, also, it, it, oh. now, as I say, so, and actually, I'm going to sort of take that back because we actually had several submissions where people were actually pasting code, like, <clears throat> and, and sample code into the, into the, and that's not actually a good example of, so, that's actually a little too much detail because in my, 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 my case, at least for a lot of talks. Yeah, it would depend on the audience, I would argue. Right. So, for things like uh, DEF CON, for example, you know, you might want to submit code to be like, hey, listen, I'm not just talking out of my butt. But this that's is actually, actually, that's a situation where if you can submit supplemental materials, right, yeah, exactly. that's where you submit that. You don't put it in your abstract or you don't exactly. put it in your supplemental materials. That's what supplemental materials are for, are things like presentations, white papers, things that establish your bona fides or your qualifications to speak, even if you're a new speaker. Say, look, here's this white paper I wrote, here's this, here, you know, here's a link to my GitHub repository that's a more code-oriented conference. Exactly. 
Here are blog posts I've written on the topic. Here's a sample presentation I did elsewhere. Um, and also, if you have sources that you used while you're writing your talk, like, okay, this is where I'm drawing my ideas from, that can be helpful too. Yes. Oh, I mean, I love it when someone submits a citation saying, hey, I'm talking about this, but it also relates to this other talk in a different way. And then I'll go in and look at it. I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of interesting, actually. And I can see, okay, this is a pre-existing talk that's been done before, yes, but this person has a new or different outlook on it. Citing work when you're submitting a CFP response shows us two things. First, it shows us that you have a, a, a grasp of the subject matter. And it also shows us that you've done your homework and you're not just trying to reiterate something of somebody else has already said, you're building upon it. And that's important. I mean, the whole point of giving a talk in front of people is to advance the state of the art. And so by showing us citations in your CFP response, you're showing us that you're willing to do the work in order to advance the state of the art. So, and, and speaking of, since we're sort of on this, on this general trend, one of the places where that we've significantly seen issues over the, over the past several years are talks where someone is releasing a new tool or discussing mm -hmm. a new tool that they've been involved with, and they don't make it clear whether it's a free tool, a commercial tool, open source, shared source, Whatever, and what ends up happening is the submission, the submission ends up reading like a product pitch. And the feedback we give is, this sounds like a product pitch. And, it really, and a good chunk of time, the person comes back and says, oh, it's open source, and you don't need to, you know, it's being released by my company who happens to be a commercial vendor, but you don't need to use the rest of the company's products. You can use it independently, you can build it yourself. And we go, tell us. Like, yeah. And does anything that looks like a product pitch at just like every conference is going to get automatically rejected. You know, at B sides especially, we're not here to let you advertise. If I wanted to hear product pitches masquerading as talks, I'd go to RSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. Some and plus a lot of CFPs when you sub, when you read the instructions will actually say we don't want vendor pitches. Exactly. So that, that goes back to following directions. And a lot of cons will actually have a separate area for vendors. I mean. You don't need to do product pitches in talks at Black Hat when you've got the entire vendor floor with an auditorium directly for product pitches. Okay, just to add on to that, there, you know, Black Hat's one of them, so is RSA, where there are. Sorry. Just to add on to that, there's conferences like those where there are tracks that are designated as, you know, what you could think of as pay for play. Like, it's, yeah. it's clearly, it's. It's kind of like when you go to Google and you search and you have their search results and you have the sponsored listings that are clearly separated. And they're both useful in their own ways as long as they're separated. Exactly. Yeah. Any questions so far or any, like we don't have to stick to the model. Make this man work, folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one of the things that's frustrating to me, I, I, I probably submit to somewhere between five to 10 conferences a year and a frustration of mine is that it's kind of a black box. Um, when I have asked about how do these talks get selected, I've had varying answers all over the board. Sometimes there's a system where they get scored and that scoring process is a matrix and it's very organized and they use like open conference and there's that and sometimes it's like uh, you know, we kind of sit around and drink a bunch of beers, and if we like it, then it gets advanced, and if we don't like it, it gets thrown on the floor. Um, do, you see, do you see any conferences moving towards some transparency when they s say we're announcing a call for papers, and we use a three-person panel with a scoring system like this, and these are the people on the panel? Because that makes a huge difference in the way that I submit, and I think that providing that transparency might help give some context to the people that are submitting. So besides Las Vegas is uh, one of the conferences and David could actually talk to this. So uh, whether you're submitting to Proving Ground or you're submitting to the general CFP here, you know, we, we have our, our CFP panel that reviews, but everyone is required on every talk that they review to provide some kind of feedback. Uh, we typically, David, correct me if I'm wrong, we typically, especially on the Proving Ground side, we will send that feedback directly to the submitter. Um, just so that we're saying, hey, we didn't think this was fully baked out or we liked it and 
but we, we weren't, you know, we had some better content or, or what's going on. Um, I know in previous years before Guy has, has joined us, uh, we actually would sit down with people that were not accepted and say, okay, this is what happened. And we have half an hour, hour calls on that. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, in the past at B-Sides, we, we have published to the CFP committee is, and we should actually get back to that and kind of fill down purely because there was too much to do and not enough time to do it all. Um, for the purposes of transparency, um, be, what we do here at, for B-Sides Las Vegas for the, for the main tracks is that we have a scoring system. We, uh, all talks get scored on a scale of one to six. Um, and then we look at, and then we basically break down the scores by track that you submitted to. And if it more or less, we have enough talks that it basically falls out on a curve. And we sort of pin a, a spot, we don't have a hard spot, but you don't really deserve a spot where it's clear that anything with this line this year is a clear accept. Anything below this number is a clear decline. And then we end up with what each track every year is like 20 to 40 talks, depending on the track. That would be fine for the, like that score wise are great for the conference, but we have like six slots left, and that's when in past years just me and this year I have a co-chair. We sit down and we look at the talks, all these talks, and say what makes the most coherent conference. What do we think really pulls that track together in a coherent frame of thought, or is there a topic that we think is really important for people to see? Um, and then we sort of go back and forth, and you know, there's a little. He had to stuff at that point, honestly. And we say, okay, this looks like the best path. This is the best talk we can put together, the best conference we can put together that'll make for the best, you know, that the attendees will enjoy or find the most uh, useful. And then we sort of go down a little bit and say, okay, here are the backup speakers we can continue that trend. And then we say, damn, we have another 15 talks that we just couldn't accept, and that's a, that, that sucks. Um, uh, actually, can I just continue on this question? Because I think it piggybacks well off a point we wanted to make a little bit later. But really around, um, it, it is, I, I hear what you're saying, Jay, because it is frustrating because I've had some, I have had talks accepted at DerbyCon, but not accepted at Sector um, and, and, and things along those lines. I think it's, it, to kind of internalize it, you really have to understand your audience, yes. right? And ensure that, hey, not every talk is for every venue. Um, and it may not be anything on your submission or a problem with it, your submission directly. It just me to, to David's point, they're trying to fit a specific theme or fit a specific feel to the event. And no offense, but maybe your talk wasn't part of it. Because like I said, my talk, I've had this exact same submission, great detail in both. Derby took it, Sector said, no, nah, that's okay. And also there's quite a few places that don't give you feedback by default. so do you make sure that you follow up for feedback for yeah. those of you who aren't familiar with that? Like we try to give, uh, each of us give feedback for why we rejected something if other than not following the directions. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, I mean, it takes a while to art tastefully state why you're rejecting certain things. Yeah. It's, it's, I've had, I mean, and, and again, it's, it's okay to ask a CFP board why a talk was rejected if you don't get feedback. I've had talks that I've submitted to Shmukon that got rejected, and the first time I was just like, oh man, that sucks. The second time I was like, why did you guys reject this talk? And they said, because the subject area is good, but we had talks like this in previous years and we want to give the subject a rest for a little bit. And that's reasonable. Like, okay, it wasn't me. It's the fact that they're trying to keep, they're trying to broaden the perspectives of the attendees of Shmukon. But, but frankly, B sides as a movement started eight years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Something like that. I lost track of whatever we're at. Um, because a bunch of us had talks get rejected by Black Hat, and the feedback consistently was, "These are good talks, and we still have enough room." We said, "You know what? We really want to give these talks." And Screw it. Said, I have a house. Come to my house. And Screw it. We'll have our own conference with blackjack and hookers. And someone else said, "I'll. Get, I can. I work for whoever it was, and we'll stream it for free online." We said, "Done." And we showed up, and B-Sides became yeah. a thing. Yeah. Um, purely because we had more, this was, there was more content. I mean, this happens to Black Hat every year in DEF CON as well. Yeah. They get way more talks than they can accept. And to a certain extent, it's a roll of dice. Remember how I said a few minutes ago that we had to take two to five minutes per talk in the first round? That's because you all submit a fuck ton of talks. <laughs> we don't have time to sit down and, and give every talk a measured 
unfortunately, we don't, the CFP boards are, are relatively small, and it's impossible to go through and give detailed, nuanced feedback on every talk. And so sometimes when you're at a talk, when you're talking about a conference like Derby, or DEF CON, or Black Hat, or Sector, it's impossible for the CFP board to give you the feedback that they want to give. And so, that's why it's important to ask. And that, that actually leads me to another next question for right now, and then we'll get to your question, which is, uh, we were discussing earlier, uh, titles matter. Mm. And title, even harder than writing a good abstract is coming up with a good title. And it's, it's an unfortunate truth that, so B-Sides had 180 some submissions across the four core tracks. That's a lot of submissions to go through. Mm. And I've done the review board for ShmooCon, and they get even more than that. Yeah. I know RSA gets literally thousands. So you need to, and you know, especially the scale of something like RSA, they're going to get 10 talks about the same topic. It's, they're almost identical. And so you need to be able to catch the reviewers' eyes just so that you get more reviews, just people looking at your talk and spending more time on it. Um, and a catchy title is really hard. And I think my panelists will share some of the formats or the sort of There's... macros that are really tired of. Okay, guys. If any of you submit a talk that is word, colon, word, ever again, you're going to make everybody on a CFP board have a sad. <laughs> also, blank for fun and profit. It's been done. Stop. Stop. Please. You just, you just gave, you just made Gary the happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm glad. <laughs> Okay, so today I delivered uh, my first presentation at Proving Ground. Congratulations. And the feedback has been good, as this man has attested. Um, so where do I go from here? I, I want to keep giving presentations. Submit them to other cons. Yeah. Then. Do I submit the same one to other cons? Do I have to now come up with new stuff? If I come back to B-Sides, do I never come back to Proving Ground? It's only the other Yeah, tracks? I will never be back here ever again. Okay. Because that's, that's the design. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm done with the single A, I'm now in the double A league. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Whoa. So on, on that note. As a guy who's local to you and who's telling you that the B-Side CFP is opening next week. <laughs> yes. A conference, some conferences feel different. I don't know about the rest of B-Side's LV. Different conferences feel differently about the same material. My mantra is I never give the same talk twice. Sometimes I give the same talk twice, but it's not really the same one. Like it's, it'll be uh, the same basic idea, but it'll have new material or updated right. or ongoing research or whatever. And, oh, so if you are going to submit the same talk, a lot of CFPs have the question, have you submitted this present presentation before? And if so, where? And it's your job to say, okay, yes, I gave it before, but here's how it's markedly different or improved from before. Because otherwise, you know, you're, just giving them re old material. Like I gave a half hour here, so if I'm applying for an hour long slot, obviously you there's need more, yeah, more material. material. Right. So, okay. Um, is it kosher to submit more than one CFP? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Vote and, or submit and so submit often. The important thing, yeah. though, okay. is so, like, we had over the years, and this happens every year, we have someone who will submit almost the same talk multiple times. Yeah. So they'll be like, they'll change the name slightly, they'll change some of the wording around, but it's really the same talk. And pretty much as soon as that happens, I go, click, 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 deny them all. Remember, this, the, the whole point of giving talks for conferences is to advance the state of the art. And if you're giving the same talk multiple times, you're rewarming leftovers. You're not advancing the state of the art. So why I put back the thing on submitting. Yeah, uh, but for submitting multiple ones, you're saying that if I say, well, I have an idea about this X and one about Y and one about Z, that's great. you that's may fine. say, well, X and Y, pff, but Z, ah. Yeah, right. right. So they actually had people do that. that. They actually had someone submit three talks about three different topics, and we said, eh, maybe, it. yes. Yeah. But then also. Or we had someone else submit two talks, and I was like, oh, man, I wish I could both of these talks. I'm going to go for this one. And I really wish I could have accepted both, but there's only so much time. And I want to. You know, diverse my speakers. So I'm gonna go for this one's on choice. Other one will get accepted somewhere else. Yeah. Just my only warning about that is be careful because they may be accepted. Oh. <laughs> and, 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 and then you have to do the work because I've been in that position as well where I've had multiple talks. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Really? I, did, I did 
it's stressful as a speaker. Yeah, and I, I can attest that I, I had two talks that thankfully I co-presented. They got accepted and placed back to back. <laughs> so just, yeah. and yeah. the more community the, the event, the more probably likely that you may get accepted for multiple talks. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so that's actually a problem. So RSA in particular is traditional to submit multiple talks because it's, it's so much of a crapshoot. Uh, two years ago, I, was doing, I ended up giving five talks. Yeah. <laughs> and one I had to do twice, so it was six, six slots in three days, and it was murder. I guess what I would say is, yeah, feel free to submit multiple talks as long as you're following the directions. Follow the fucking directions. As long as you're following the directions. Yeah. Follow the fucking directions. It's not that hard. You guys have been doing it since, well, no, you guys haven't been doing that's it. That's why we're all here. <laughs> yeah. But in this one case, okay. follow the directions. Yes. I have a question, and, and I'm happy to hear this from either side, even for the submitters or the reviewers, because like Bowie, like I do a lot of both. Uh, one of the things that I get tired of and B-Sides LV is fantastic about and is I'm tired of going to conferences and seeing everybody look like me. Mm. Like, you mean like, an, like, like, a, like, like, like a, a white dude, dude with a beard and a black, in a black shirt? I mean, that's I'm, just the reality. I'm wearing, I'm wearing a blue yeah, shirt. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm young. Well, I'm youngish. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not. Right, right, right. No, but, but we fit. In other words, it is important to me for a lot of different reasons, I know it's important to a lot of people that at least, certainly from the speaker level we get people who are not traditionally as represented. I am curious both from the side of how do we encourage more of these submissions because I want that and how can we make sure that, we, yeah, so how can we make that happen more from your perspective? I, oh, I think I'm hitting the hot button here. I'm like just it. like, Jesus take the wheel. Um, <laughs> 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 Tati's moved back to the south and this is my response. <laughs> this is my response. <laughs> so first of all, as a reviewer, the name of the person so with OpenConf, we don't see the name of the person when we first review the talk. And I would actually caution against looking at the name or Googling the handle until after you've determined whether or not you want to accept the talk. Because I'm going to be pissed off if I find out that my talk was accepted because I'm a female versus the merits of my talk. Sure. Right. However, as okay. someone who has been involved in several conferences, I have very little problem when getting to that window of we have 20 talks that, are, that we would like to accept and four slots to make sure there's diversity. Because if they are all on look, the same, yes, that's the thing. Well, please, I'm down to the bucket. I don't get names until I have my bucket up. I have okay. ten talks and four slots. I'm going to bias because the so, thing is, there's a lot of inherent bias in the system, as you as you know. Yeah. And so, and so that's just my, my the thing is like when when B sides started, we had almost no women submitting. Yeah. And now we had that panel on the first well, B sides. Right. That was the only one yeah. that was that submitted. Well, that, and I agree with that. Only right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and now the submission rate is like 40% female. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Like it last year, half of our speakers have done it. Because one of the ways you get more women submitting is by having representation of women. And now it's not a problem because women submit now. Uh, because, uh, trust me. So there, there are far smarter people who have given yeah, far so better awesome. talks and presentations on this than I. I want to see but one of the reasons why I love this program, why I love the Proving Grounds program, is because you're pairing people with mentors. And I think mentorship is one of the biggest things that we can do to sort of work towards solving this problem. Because a lot of people come from backgrounds, and a lot of people, women especially, and friends that I've talked to are saying, well, I don't know if I'm good enough to submit this talk. I'm like, you're doing amazing work in cutting edge areas with really cool shit. You need to submit this talk. But Imposter also, syndrome is really yeah, strong, yeah. and mentorship is one of the ways we mentorship counter that. But, uh, this is a, okay, having a code of conduct on the website to start with matters. Yeah. It actually will change the, your submission metrics hugely. Yeah. Just the basis of that. An explicit statement to that effect. Yeah. So I yeah. would say mentor. Like yeah. even outside the B sides program. Just if, yeah, if, yeah. If, I, I was talking to him earlier, one of the other conferences I'm involved in, we were a little bit surprised. So one of the other conferences I'm involved in, 
we were actually inspired by Proving Ground in particular. So when we were first having the discussions, you know, with us, we have, you have three buckets, right? You have the talks that you're absolutely not going to accept. It's just not going to happen. You have the talks that you really want to, and you have some that maybe, you don't know, right? That they, with the right thing. So we're trying to find ways to assign mentors um, or, or do some sort of mentorship in some. Yeah. We, I, I we, we, we try to bias towards speakers who are less well known. Yeah. 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 So that was what I was going to say. Right. When I have 10 speakers in four slots, I'll look at the names, see their speaker resume, and those who are the least experienced or have something that's actually like a fresh voice, I'm more willing to choose yeah. those individuals. Right. Exactly. And frankly, like, I don't need random speaking slots. No. Yeah. I mean, I've given literally hundreds of talks at this point in my career. Oh. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, and that's the thing about Proving Ground, and this yeah. is true, is that conferences need good speakers. They need speakers, okay. period. And I got told by a, a mentor of mine 12 years ago, she said, you should be speaking at conferences. I said, I have nothing to say. She said, trust me, you do. Um, and once you give them two or three talks, people will, you become a known quantity. And then you'll start getting asked to submit to conferences. And it's totally true, even now. And yeah. the best mentoring you can do in the community is, I've, uh, even, I was talking to someone um, at the airport. I was sitting on our layover, and they're like, well, I, 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 I've been thinking about talking, kids submitting to conferences, yeah. but I don't really have anything to say. And I said, well, what do you do? And they said, well, I, do, I, I work at a storage company that does storage in the cloud. And I said, well, and I make sure that I run security for them. And I'm like, so how do you deal with compliance and your customers? And they're like, I'm like, you've got to talk. And I'm like, they're like, okay, you have a talk right there. Write that up. You're submitting to Proving Ground next year. And I said, okay. Yeah, and they got accepted. Didn't they? No, this is for now. This was literally like oh, this, this year. Is, I'm only because here. we had a storage security talk this year. Yeah, this is like so. they, they were they were cloud storage in the cloud manager, yeah. and he's like, I'm like, okay, you have a submission now, and they're like, okay, I'm submitting to Proving Ground next year. Yes. So. Well, that's just, um, yeah, and, yeah, and the other question. thing, I'm I'm, I'm oh. sorry, I just want to ex on, on diversity for one more second. The other thing we do in, in Proving Ground to to kind of rule that out as a as a factor at all is a lot of our process and Tati hit it on it on the CFP review side is that's blind to us. We don't see names, we don't see anything. But when we're doing our pairing between speaker and mentor, the speakers and or the, the mentors get to choose their speakers. They don't know who that speaker is. So they don't know if they're choosing right. they a the male or female. Right. So they're they're basing, hey I really want to jump on this based on the content and why this talk is chosen. So uh, that, that's another thing is, is try to remove that diversity as even a factor because the content's standing up, standing on itself. Yeah. So, question here. Question. Question. Awesome. Uh, so we've been talking a lot on the sort of B sides or larger conference style uh, where you have way more talks than slots. And I'm curious about the other end of the spectrum uh, and what sort of what you've seen on that side where you potentially don't have enough talks and what you can do about that, whether it's trying to garner more, more people, restricting slots, lowering your standards, like what sort of approaches do you take there? This is, this is really lower. No, don't, don't lower your standards at all. Well, no. um, hit Twitter, hit Facebook, and you know, find people you know who have given talks in the past or are willing to give talks. Ask around. Try something different. Try doing, you know, redesignate a session as birds, uh, uh, a segment as birds of a feather session where people show up and sign up spur of the moment to do things or start to say, find someone who's willing to do a free training. Yeah, it, 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 no, no, sorry. Just go ahead. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, to your point, there's so many different things. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're an organizer, you want to bring content and that content could be in several different formats and, and trying to, again, get content that fits your venue and the theme that you're trying to hit. Think one, think for your first, think one day, one track, then you only need like six speakers. Um, in fact, we recommend is that if you talk, if you email info at securitybsides.org, uh, we can send you your. We have a sort of starter kit for doing you know, sides, which applies to any conference. The, the big recommendation is one day, one track to get started. If you've never run a conference before, particularly in a smaller, a smaller region. Do you have a question back there? Yeah, I had a question about putting in a CFP that is not a specific technical talk in infosec. So. I was in Proving yes. Ground and I was a past software developer in law school and I submitted a legal talk and I kind of really struggled with the CFP on 
Hi, I'm going to come in and do a legal talk. How much legal background do I need to put into the CFP so you have any idea what I'm talking about? So do you have any recommendations in general when it's not a super technical? So that was actually one of the things we talked about earlier. I'm so excited about this. Yes, you yeah. Yeah. By the way, Wendy had a fantastic talk today. She you really all need to go did. up and see the recording. Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. But Tony has some thoughts earlier today about specifically this topic about right. the CFP section. So I think if you submit something that is related to the InfoSec field, but not super technical, it also it would definitely help to use the uh, words and terms that we can understand and grasp, because a lot of lawyer speak goes way over my head. But if you can give me metaphors and analogies, that's more than sufficient. Short one syllable words. Short one syllable words are good. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like half of my mentor's job was I don't know what that word means to me. Yeah, exactly. Right. So okay. that's good feedback because if he if they don't know what it is, then chances are the audience doesn't right. know. So, so we have a problem in InfoSec where we're kind of stuck in this echo chamber where we just like preach to the choir. We're like, oh, we need to talk about user awareness. And it's like, oh, um, no. what do you guys know about user awareness? What we need to do is bring in people from other fields to talk to us about things like privacy, compliance, auditing, management, whatever, law, law psychology, um, and then we need to go out to other industries and talk to them. And in order to do so, in, in order to be successful with this, we need to use a common language. One thing I would, would actually, this is actually something I've had a discussion with with a number of colleagues. If you're having trouble getting your talk submitted to a security conference, submit it to a non-security conference. There are tons of development conferences. There are tons of, of other industry-specific conferences. There, I mean, tech is, is a large umbrella. We are one small part of it. And we're the ones that focus on security, but that doesn't mean that people in other fields need to hear about, don't need to hear about this as well. Right. Submit a security talk. Submit a web application security talk to a web application conference. So, so we, it was actually two pieces of advice that your question brought up to me that we were discussing earlier uh, as we were planning our, our panel here. One is that when you're submitting your talk, alter your bio, you know, you know, focus in your bio on the parts that are relevant to your talk's content. Um, it, you know, right. and, also and most security conferences, no one's going to care if you're a CISSP or not. Yeah. Unless your talk is about, about certifications, in which case it may be relevant. Um, the other thing is, um, I'm sure my panel has some thoughts on this, is that the whole many eyes make all bugs shallow. So mm. if you're not sure about your abstract, I mean, even if you're positive about your abstract, get someone else to read it. Yes. Um, particularly, just in general, make sure you have to, you know, bring it down. People say, is this a talk you would want to see? Like, does this excite you? But the other thing is, particularly if you're in, in a field that touches on security, say legal stuff like that, bring that to someone who is not a lawyer or who is not trained in legal and say, would you go see this? Does this make sense to you? Right. Um, so you can get that, that perspective, like your mentor was giving you going, I don't know what these 12 words mean. This could mean anything. Be um. be before I submit any talk, I have three friends that I ha yeah. asked to review. I have a very technical you one. You have three friends? Oh. For the purposes of this. Oh, no, no, no. No, I, I wouldn't be friends with this fucker. Are you kidding? No. No. no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> He's, so I, I have someone very technical, someone, uh, someone very technical, someone who's not technical, and, then me. And, and just a third party, just another set of eyes, someone who I consider a peer at work or something that will review something for me just to say, hey, is this something you would like to see? What are your thoughts? Uh, just to kind of bounce that off. And, and sometimes they give, have given me very harsh feedback. The yeah. Technical guys, a lot of my talks are a little bit more soft skill. Technical is like, no, nah, I don't want to see this. And okay. Also, and also, this also falls into the whole know your audience thing. Mm. So you're not going to want to go to, um, I don't know, I don't have a good example. <clears throat> don't take a D for talk to the compliance folks. Yeah. And vice versa. And vice versa. Right. Don't so, take a secure development talk to the compliance folks. One thing that I like to do is before I submit a talk anywhere, I'll look up the conference that I'm looking to submit to and look at the past two years presentations and say, and say, see, okay, this is the kind of talks they accept. Would my content fit this? Would the audience be interested in this? And really, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, was there another question? Yeah. Oh, okay, please. Yeah. 
Uh, hi, I'll, I'll preface it by saying I only speak English, but I'm just wondering if you guys have ever received talks or would consider talks um, in another language, like not English. Yeah, so we have a lot of non-native English speakers uh, presenting at our at proving grounds, actually. Yeah, at this proving grounds, too. I think this year we had at least one or two. Yeah. So, yeah. And so... Yeah, Virginia Robbins is, is yeah. French, and she's presenting a talk on fileless malware. And she's giving a fantastic talk. So for non-native speakers, I would actually, I don't know if you would want to say that you're a non-native speaker in the CFP or not. It's usually evident. It's, it's pretty it's not, evident. It's, it's not always evident. But, but, but sometimes when it is evident, I try to take that into consideration when I review. Like, so, okay, this content's still good, and if they have something to share, I still want to yeah. give them an, a venue to yeah, share. Yeah, it, I, I, would, I would actually think the opposite. And the ones that, that I've read, at least sometimes their grammar and their English is probably better than native yeah. English speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So just just to clarify, um, so so not necessarily accent based, but the actual presentation itself. Like if it was like, entirely in French, is that something that's because well, uh, like there there's a conference. Maybe so in besides Paris. Yeah, I mean generally, oh. yeah. I mean most conferences these days are actually in English, regardless of where you go in the world. Um, I mean there's lots of the, lots of conferences that are language specific, but anything that pulls an international audience is generally in English. Um, unfortunate. Well, unfortunate. Good for us. That's true. But they, but they will often have an English language track even at that. Right. So I, I actually spoke at a conference in, uh, in Colombia, and all the talks, almost all the talks were in English. Uh, and um, they were doing simultaneous translation. They, trans they had simultaneous translation into uh, Spanish, French, and Portuguese, right. and Japanese, actually, uh, going on for people who were, non who were not comfortable with English. Uh, it's a little, little less scope. If you give a talk, to a non-native English speaking population, jokes don't work. And you need to slow the fuck down because they're translating in their heads. But seriously, jokes just don't work. Yeah. Okay, okay one yeah. time for one more question there in the back and then we need to wrap up. Yeah, because food. Yes, because food. Mm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Uh, thank you for you know being there and answer our questions. Um, yeah. I actually this is my first time to be sides. Yay! Yay. Uh, Welcome. Um, so I I'm really excited to actually present here um, sometime whenever either here or somewhere um, because I, you just told us that I mean unlike Black Hat and Def Con where they see your bios and you know how many times you have presented and how famous are you, you actually look at the content. Because honestly, I was attending one talk, and, and, and I have a startup. I'm a founder of a startup. And, and I, the area I was working on, I was attending those talks. And it was interesting to see how customers are thinking about that problem. And, and I think that I don't know how you feel about it, but I think like as a vendor, not about your product, but as a vendor, I felt like talking about the challenges that we have to reach to these customers and get their data and share with us and work with us to build these products. So I wonder if you gave a chance to people like me to speak and, and, and if yes, what's the next step that I should be doing for the next event? It's absolutely. To proving grounds? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> submit to proving grounds. If you, if you, yes, yeah. submit to proving grounds if you haven't been doing public speaking at a, at a major conference. Uh, clearly, you know, please submit to you know, the main tracks as well. Um, every year, um, I don't think this year. Most years, we have a few talks that get submitted to Proving Ground, where the speaker is just so outstanding that yeah. we actually actually in the last in the last year too, we had two talks. Yeah, we, we had one that we kicked over this year. Yeah, yeah. they had two yeah. talks last year that were so good they kicked it over to us, and actually both of them were given in I think Common Ground, uh, but they got their, they got to keep their mentors, so they got their yeah. but the talks were good enough. Uh, that we, there was too many there was too many, too many too many Proving Grounds ground submissions. And there were two talks that these two said, you know what, these would be great in the main tracks. And so they, they had mentors and they gave, they were brand new speakers, never spoken, but gave 15 minute long presentations and they were awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, something like that is, is just really how you position it. You know, we, we kind of hit on earlier, we, we not necessarily want to hear a product pitch, but, you know, if you were to position that something like, how do you work with vendors to build better products? 
you know, and under, so that people here can understand that the life cycle, you know, because I, I forgot who was presenting earlier, but, you know, no one raised their hands when they say, oh, who likes talking to vendors, right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, it, it, if we could understood, well, vendors are part of that conversation, that's a way to introduce your topic appropriately. Just don't call your talk vendors, cooling. <laughs> How to work with them. <laughs> However, and follow the fucking directions. Yeah. But call it vendors, vendors, vendors might actually get accepted. I would actually, yeah, I would actually bump that up just to developers, the, developers, developers, developers. Right, exactly. Yeah. Developers, developers. But I'm cool with that. Okay, so we we do, we, we do need to wrap it up. Um, any final thoughts? I know my final thought is read the fucking directions and then follow them. Um, so I I have one final thought. Um, something that we didn't cover is. Um, when you're submitting, if you have the room, um, provide an outline. Um, show us that, I mean, probably, I, I know I do before I submit, you have a thought process of what's going on, what you want to present, how you're going to present it. Use the space and show how you're going to actually get to your talk. Uh, that provides us as the reviewers a, a, a good, clear understanding of where you're going to take this talk and, and what's going to go what's gonna go on, you know, a quick bullet list. These are the, the five, seven topics that I'm gonna cover. This is the format I'm gonna cover it in. Even if the, it's not fully baked out, I mean, start sketching that out really helps us as reviewers. Details, yeah. details, and details. To, to, to follow up on what he's saying, having that outline in place saves you a shit ton of work when it, if your talk actually gets accepted. Because now, hey, you've got a basis for your slides. Yeah, and so mine is kind of like a two-parter. First of all, don't be afraid to submit something just because you think someone has covered it in another talk, it's okay. Because you might have a fresh perspective or give us information in your CFP that we might not have seen in a previous talk. And then also, if you submit a CFP about something you're really passionate about, that comes across in your writing and we're more excited to accept it. Because it's something you're actually interested in and we can see that by the level of detail you give us, the information that you give us, instead of something like, oh, Oops, IoT is that. cool right now, I guess I'll do an IoT talk. Yeah, so, um, raise your hands if you've, if you've done a fair enough, if you, do, if you speak regularly at conferences. Okay. I would say that, I, I do as well, I would estimate that anywhere between 30 to 60% of my talks in a year get rejected. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Giving to write, CFP, writing CFPs is really hard, and the only way to get better at it is to do it a lot. So don't be no. disparaged if you when you submit your if you submit to a conference and it gets rejected. Don't be disparaged if you submit to three or four or five conferences. You will start getting talks accepted, particularly if you can get good feedback on what's going on. But the first couple are going to be hard. Plus, even if you've been submitting for years, you're still going to get. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. I've been right. speaking for. I had two talks. I mean, look at David's hair. I mean, and he still gets rejected. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for coming.